Good morning, everyone. Is this, can you all hear me? Is it good? Mike, good. okay, good. Sorry to interrupt, great conversation, I know, but it's time to get started and we've got uh, folks live streaming. So um, again, I wanna say good morning to everyone. Um, we're delighted to see you here in person or to greet you um, online if you're live stream streaming to explore and work together today toward becoming the beloved community. I'm Cindy Malinick and I'm um, the director of the museum here at the Jewel, as we ref affectionately refer to her, Auburn University's Extraordinary Art Museum. And we're um, so delighted to have you here and it's my pleasure to greet you today. In 2018, to commemorate 50 years since the Martin Luther King Jr. assassination, the museum partnered with Dr. Joan Harrell and the College of Liberal Arts to host a series of intergenerational, interdisciplinary, and interfaith discussions. We are again grateful to resume this important initiative to help prepare students for life and leadership in a multicultural world. No doubt today will be filled with serious, and perhaps concerning conversation and imagery, and yet also filled with hope and resilience. Before we begin though, and as we do here with all of our engagements, I would first like to acknowledge the history and stewardship of the original homelands and territory of the Creek indigenous people on which Auburn University is sited. Descended from the mound builders of the Mississippi River Valley. They lived here, raising their families, farming, growing a variety of crops until forcibly removed during the Trail of Tears. A clan of these people, the Porch Band, remained to the south of us. And no doubt, their enduring relationship with this place continues. I call forth the creek because it's important for us to always seek to understand our place in the world within that longstanding relationship and history. So we have an engaging and full day uh, ahead and um, great panelists and speakers and guests. I hope during the break though, during breaks, lunch, coffee, et cetera, you might find your way into the galleries, especially to see a new initiative that we entitled Object Lab. This is an experimental classroom and it invites students and faculty and the community to investigate works on view and contribute their own thoughts, poetry, other kinds of written expression on post-its. So you'll see post-its all around those pieces. Uh, Manal and uh, Elijah, you wanna do that one slide for me, please? Um, uh, I'll draw your attention to that space in particular to a work from Auburn's collection, Drinking Fountain by Gordon Parks, who's the subject of this afternoon's film screening. In this image, one from a series the artist created while working for Life magazine in 1956, we observe history seemingly frozen in time through a car window as he's driving by and capturing this. The fountains with their segregated text, shocking in their own right, are juxtaposed against innocuous, innocuously placed ice cream ads. They're jarring. We also see a young black woman leaning in for a drink of water from the fountain clearly labeled for her. And there's a little girl, perhaps her daughter, we don't know. She's nearby with a hand on her hip, peering into the store windows. Who did that little girl grow up to become? How did this moment and these fountains shape her life, the adult woman's life? These are just a few of a multitude of questions <clears throat> art can evoke and that our audiences 
and honestly, we're all co-learners here, can interrogate, creating conversations around race, representation, and community. I extend my deepest appreciation to our organizing partners and the entire museum staff for their significant efforts surrounding today. And it's my profound honor to work with all of you day by day. I'm also grateful to museum donors for their investment that support these and other programs and our unit leadership, Interim Provost Dr. Vinnie Nathan and the Office of the Provost. And now it's my pleasure to welcome to the podium Dr. Taffy Clayton, Vice President and Associate Provost for Inclusion and Diversity at Auburn University. Thank you so much, my friend. Good morning, everyone. I, have you heard, am Taffy Benson Clayton, and I'm really excited to be here. I want to bring you greetings and welcome you, uh, certainly on behalf of my office and the many other senior leaders who engage uh, with me, just left, left a cabinet meeting excited about coming over here. Welcome to Becoming the Beloved Community at Auburn University, a commemoration of the assassination of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I am fully appreciating the contribution this program has made to Auburn University and our broader community since its inception in 2018. In April of that year, as you've heard some already, we premiered the first Becoming the Beloved Community, which featured intergenerational, interdisciplinary, and interfaith discussions, and a panel that featured several luminaries, uh, to mention just a couple, Dr. Otis Ma Moss III and our own Dr. Wayne Flint. And here we are uh, again today grateful for the ability to be present in this space again, right? And to be proximate um, again. I'm particularly excited about, uh, about that part. Uh, and to continue our institutional legacy of commemorating the state, this great leader, Dr. King, and this term referencing reconciliation, mutual care and benefit and care for humankind. I wanna talk a little, just a bit about Dr. Harrell. I won't dwell too much because she's modest, but the vision of Dr. Joan Harrell in conceptualizing and actualizing this idea that is becoming the beloved community at Auburn University substantively enriches our campus community. Her grant from the Luce Foundation in support of curating an Alabama-based mobile institute speaks to the value of her idea that we are all engaging around. I should note that the Office of Inclusion and Diversity's connection and commitment to supporting Dr. Harrell's idea began in the fall of 2017, when our office uh, was able to fund the Becoming the Beloved Community and it gave it its first grant. It also gave students the opportunity to create and to develop their thoughts, a digital space that narrates, has opinion articles, podcasts, multimedia projects, all of these things written and produced by our students and faculty about things like belongingness, about DEI issues, about social justice issues, about inclusion at a local, national, and international level with respect to community and strengthening community ties. So thank you for being here today. And I'm particularly excited about the panel to my right, uh, many of our esteemed faculty and administrators from Auburn University and others. And Dr. Harrell, please thank you, uh, or know that I thank you for the opportunity to support such important faculty ideas and projects at Auburn. This work continues, and I believe Auburn is better for it. Let's have a great experience together. Good morning, welcome all. 
I'm Anna Frankel Watkins, Interim Dean of the College of Liberal Arts. I want to welcome each of you today for uh, being here for um, the be becoming the beloved community. This annual conference provides opportunities for members of the public, Auburn students, faculty, staff to engage with one another and to explore the intersectionality of race, arts, religion, media, and culture. Since April 2018, and all of us have spoken about this, the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., members of the Auburn University and East Alabama communities have come together to learn, to listen, to share contextual, personal, and community stories to better understand why inequity perpetuates discrimination. Becoming the beloved community brings together people who believe that inclusivity and belongingness are essential for the community. Today we are here to embark upon the official inaugural Alabama-based institute Becoming the Beloved Community Humanities Project with the monetary help from the Henry Luce Foundation grant from the uh, Vanderbilt University School of Public Theology and Racial Justice Collaborative. The College of Liberal Arts also supports the Auburn University Becoming the Beloved Community Humanities Digital Project. That's a mouthful to say. <laughs> that critiques and implements work for equity, inclusivity, access and belongingness in learning and living environments. Auburn University journalism, media studies, photojournalism students have been writing and producing uh, multimedia narratives for the Becoming the Beloved Community website, and this will be launched on May 1st. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you today Dr. Joan Harrell founder of the Auburn University Becoming the Beloved Community Humanities Digital Project. Her vision and passion are evident in her work and her commitment to becoming the beloved community, and you'll experience this over the next two days. We look forward to learning, engaging, and connecting with one another over the next few days and I would also like to announce that starting in May 16th, Dr. Harrell will be our inaugural Director of Inclusive Excellence at the College of Liberal Arts. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Harrell. Greetings. Uh, Dean Franco Watkins pulled a surprise on me. Yes, I knew about it, but I did not know she was going to make the announcement today. So thank you. Um, it is not by chance that we find ourselves here 54 years after the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. And so before I continue on, I'd just like for us to pause for a moment and think about where our nation, our world was, the state of Alabama was 54 years ago, just for a moment. For some of you, um, because I'm a person of faith, you had not made it here yet. But unfortunately, um, you have experienced the... Uh, mental, emotional, physical, perhaps, pain of the isms. Um, but we're need, it is an opportunity for us uh, now to also continue the legacy of Dr. King and focus on beloved, which the root word of beloved is um, much loved. Um, he and others, we'll talk more about that, were examples of what it takes to share much love in the midst of intentional 
pain. So just for a moment, let us have a moment of silence, lifting his name as well as the names of others who made it possible, children, women, men, youth, college students, people across the world that made it possible for us to be here today to lift up the legacy of Dr. King. A moment of silence, please. Thank you. So I share with, uh, just very quickly, uh, persons who are in person, uh, people who are in person with us, as well as uh, live uh, streaming, just very quickly. Now I'm going to switch to my broadcast journalism mode and uh, thank my sponsors very quickly, my supporters, my co-creators. I thank Auburn University, um, the Office of Inclusion and Diversity, Jules Collins Smith Museum of Fine Arts at Auburn University, who have been with me from the fall of 2017, when literally I had been on campus, moved here from Washington, D.C. for three months. Uh, I also like to thank uh, the interfaith community of Auburn, um, as well as the Macon County Ministers uh, a council in um, Macon, from uh, which is based in uh, Macon County, which is based in Tuskegee, um, and just very quickly, I'd like to acknowledge um, persons in the room who have traveled as far as Chicago, Illinois, to be with us today, and uh, I <laughs> just like for them to, if you don't mind, I know I'm pushing it, just stand for a moment because you've traveled with us from Governor State University. Thank you. And they've actually arrived on Friday. And so we started out our tour on Saturday. Uh, we were blessed. Um, we were given the rare opportunity to actually uh, travel to Mobile, Alabama and be 5,000 feet away from the Clotilda, the slave ship that has been discovered in Mobile. So we left Mobile, we left the Clotilda, that sacred space, traveled on to Selma, Alabama, to, uh, to walk across the Pettus Bridge and to the EJI, the Equal Justice Initiative, and they're here with us today. So thank you, Dr. Wes, Dr. Amy, to all the students uh, for making this commitment. And they too will begin a Becoming the Beloved Community Gathering, which will be our partners in the Chicagoland area. And so now for a moment of, of truth, don't panic. So life happens. Dr. Robert Jones, unfortunately, his flight has been canceled twice since uh, the morning but I just re literally received a text. He's landed in Atlanta, so he's on his way. All right, so we say prayers, good thoughts that he gets here safely. All will be well. And he's told me to tell everyone, thank you for being here. But our purpose, he said, in the honor of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King must go on. And so with that said, in the light of justice, micro and macro aggressions. Dr. Ashley Brown, and uh, I haven't seen her arrive yet. If she's here, Dr. Hunter has not arrived yet, but Dr. Ashley Brown, if you would please stand. The reason why I'm asking her to stand, don't clap yet, please. But she and, uh, as well as Dr. A um, Evelyn Hunter is professor in counseling. Dr. Brown is a licensed counselor. Dr. Brown and her colleagues, they are online as well as they're in the space with us because we're preparing to uh, discuss, to be reminded of microaggressions, of, of brutality, uh, and this can trigger trauma. So if you have not been with us before, Becoming the Beloved Community, whether we are on Zoom or in person, we're very intentional about having trained persons to be available to you during, at breaks, and even after um, 
we meet. And so today, Dr. Brown uh, and others will be there here for us throughout the day. Uh, the space is available outside, but you will see them posted there. And look for Dr. Brown again, and she can share with you where her colleagues are. All right. So um, I can't thank you enough uh, for being here and for being, being uh, uh, intentional about coming to this safe and brave space as well as to, for being intentional about being willing to look each other in the eye to hold authentic conversations. So I think you've heard enough from me and it's my honor to turn it over to my, uh, actually, I'm gonna say my, my uh, in the words of uh, Du Bois, my, uh, my dual colleague, my colleague in, um, in this work, as well as he's my fellow colleague in the Africana Studies uh, Affiliates Program, Dr. Elijah Gaddis, and he will introduce our esteemed panelists. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for, for being here. Uh, and uh, I hope that, that all of us, me, uh, can can serve in place of, uh, of Dr. Jones, a wholly inadequate substitute, but we have uh, brilliant minds up here today that I'm really grateful to be on the stage with. Uh, I, I want to introduce them in, in just a minute, but, but I want to talk a little bit first about um, this, this broad topic that we're coming together to discuss today. And I want to start by noting something that maybe seems obvious, that objects and images have power. It might seem obvious to say that, especially given that we are in an art museum. And, and I'll, I'll echo Cindy's uh, hope that you all uh, walk around here at some point today, see these galleries and see the, the intelligence, the skill, the artistry, the emotion, the affect, right? That just comes off of being in a room with these, these, uh, these incredible works. Uh, but I also think that when we say that, right, when we, when we say that objects and images have power, uh, perhaps we don't often think about what that power is exactly, uh, what it is these, these things are able to do. And as I was sort of meditating on this this, this morning and over the past several days, um, I began thinking uh, about uh, lots of things that these these objects, images that surround us uh, that are both central to our lives, but in many ways go unnoticed by us uh, about some of the things that they might do. They might document a, a moment in time that would otherwise be forgotten. We might even say that they might serve as, as objects of witness, right? Uh, that, that powerful uh, um, uh, kind of, of work that something can do. Uh, objects and images can serve as ways to memorialize, right? Ways to remember people that have gone before us or uh, events uh, that we don't want to forget or places that we have been. But they can also serve to help us forget or to silence Right. Uh, very often, and, and I'll invoke here Dr. Jones, since he won't be here, who shared with us for today images from his his 19th century family Bible, which include uh, the names of enslaved people uh, that that his family brought with them on their migrations. That is a way of both remembering and forgetting and silencing, right, holding that within uh, a family. Uh, that, that painful, shameful secret. Objects, too, can serve to, to hold our shame, to invoke trauma, to do many of these, these kinds of things. And I think, finally, they can serve to symbolize. And they can, they can be symbols uh, either of, of despair, regret, shame, trauma, these things, or symbols of hope, of becoming, of promise, uh, of, of all these many things. And so, uh, and so I'm talking in these big, big uh, ideas today, uh, and, and I hope we're going to kind of get down to the nitty gritty here. But I did want to just open with that kind of 
that that evocation um, uh, and that that invitation to all of us to to look to when we can not in the art museum to touch uh, to think to meditate uh, with these objects and images that we'll be both be talking about today uh, as well as other ones in in your your life uh, that might get us thinking about these issues of race. Uh, of religion, of, of racial violence, of, of, of trauma, but also of healing, reconciliation, and, and repair. And so I want to sort of open with those words and those, uh, those, those ideas of what these things can be as, as we begin our conversation this morning. And I'm, I'm so delighted uh, uh, to be here again uh, on the stage uh, with, with so many uh, brilliant people uh, from so many disciplines, so many places across this, this university. Um, it always makes the job of moderator easy um, when uh, when uh, you're, you're the you're the sort of uh, the the dumb one in the room. So I'm very happy to uh, I'm very happy to be here with these with these folks uh, who I'm going to uh, I'm going to kind of be quiet and cede the floor to here in just a minute after I quickly introduce them. Uh, I'm not a big one for, for introductions, so we'll go through this quickly. Uh, uh, Dr. Virginia Sanchez, Assistant Professor of Communication here at Auburn. Uh, Mai Lee is the news editor at the, the Auburn Plainsman. Dr. Shapewa Thomas, she has more titles, so we've got to do a Director of Faculty Engagement and Professor of Council, Counselor Education. And Dr. Linda Gibson Young, Professor of Nursing. Uh, so, what we're going to do this morning is each of us is going to talk for a few minutes, uh, uh, kind of in the order that I just introduced. Um, and, and then uh, we are going to open up our conversation. I have lots of thoughts and questions for, for each of you, um, but I especially hope that, that you all will participate as, as well. Uh, and we'll kind of open things up, up to, to each of you. Uh, and I know we'll have someone going around with a microphone uh, to make sure that we can all hear, hear one another and those at home can hear us as well. So uh, without, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Sanchez. Thank you, and can you all hear me with a mask on? Yeah. Okay, perfect, if not, I can take it off. Um, so as Dr. Gatta said, I'm an assistant professor in communication, and to contextualize uh, my work a little bit, um, I tend to study uh, topics that affect the immigrant community. For a very long time, I've been focused on Latin American immigrants, and specifically the relationship that uh, parents, immigrant parents, have with their children. And I'm recently starting to expand my work outside of that population as well. So um, I guess I'll start by explaining the image on our screen. Um, what you see there, this, so this was actually taken in Chicago, which works really well because I had no idea that you were all going to be here. Um, <laughs> but I, I grew up in Milwaukee, so a lot of uh, my earlier work was in the Midwest. So the image was actually taken at the Families Belong Together March in Chicago in 2018. You were there? Perfect. We oh. might have run into each other. Yeah. <laughs> I'll check the, the background of my other images. You might be in them. Um, so in this image, you see a young man waving the American flag. And the march actually took place in a time where a lot of people were becoming aware of what happens when um, immigrants and refugees arrive at the border. We saw images of um, families living in tents without beds, without even sheets to cover themselves. We also saw pictures of children in cages. And while those images, I think, are very worthy of discussing, um, I think what is interesting about this image is the, the fact that every time we have protests or marches or demonstrations that are related to immigration in some way, we see the American flag. And the American flag is kind of like the low-hanging fruit here. I could have picked other things, the Statue of Liberty, um, you know, just these other images that often are tied to patriotism, to freedom, and to liberty. They tend to have, for a lot of people, not for everyone, these very positive connotations. Um, and this is interesting for immigrants because the, the presence of this flag in a demonstration is very indicative of how we talk about immigrants societally. And... Generally, if we pay close attention, immigrants are 
expected to be contributors to, uni to the United States. Um, that is through their work, you know, by paying their taxes. That's something that comes up a lot by serving, sometimes in the military, sometimes in other ways. But another part of their contribution um, is that they're expected to be very patriotic and to really buy into what it means to be American, even though what we're really talking about is not all of America, it's just the United States. Um, and so they're, they're expected to buy into this very extremely patriotic view of the United States. Uh, and while that may work for some, you know, some people are very, very proud to carry the flag, that's not the case for others. And so I've got a quotation on the next slide uh, that comes from someone I interviewed. And this is a, a quote from Adriana. And Adriana is a pseudonym, so it's not her real name. I'm protecting her. Uh, and she entered the United States when she was seven years old from Mexico. And she's talking about what it means to be a, a good immigrant. Okay? So she says, to be a good immigrant, you have to have like a superpower. It's like, be good in school, be super good with the law, and be super American and proud to be in America, which is unrealistic for a lot of people. To be someone that is perfect, and at times me and my sister felt that we needed to be perfect to be accepted here. Um, I also want to mention that uh, Adriana was uh, or is undocumented, uh, and so obviously her perspective is going to be a little bit different. Um, and, I, and I present this quote to you not to tell you that you shouldn't feel pride for being in the United States or, you know, in the flag, but just to open up the possibility that this is a viewpoint that not others have. Even if we think about immigrants, not everyone feels the same way as Adriana does. Uh, and so what might signify freedom and patriotism for one person might be a symbol of pressure, oppression, or even acceptance for someone else. Thank you. Hi, you guys hear me okay? All right, great. So like uh, Dr. Gaddis said, I currently serve as a news editor for the Auburn Plainsman, and I'm also a junior majoring in journalism. So basically that means that my entire life is just journalism at this point. And um, at the same time, I also exist in this space of being a minority in a predominantly white institution. And the intersection between these two things is tangible and real as someone who tends this PWI. I'm constantly surrounded by whiteness and there's initially this looming feeling of tokenism in all environments you enter, especially as a freshman, as an 18 year old. Um, and uh, it, it's been a constant in my life because I'm also from a small town uh, with predominantly white Americans. And the Plainsman has provided me with just some amazing resources and opportunities and friendships. But at the same time, it's a small reflection of the Auburn campus, which is not a very diverse one for the most part. So with the rise of the pandemic, we also saw this rise in Asian American hate crimes. And it was sort of at its peak last year when I spoke at Dr. Harrell's um, Becoming the Beloved Community of April, 2021. And so with this rise, and I spoke then about its emotional impacts on me as an immigrant, as someone far away from home, and as an Asian American, but with this rise and how big of a role that journalism played into my life, there was always this need in my head, at least, to write about it and get an opportunity and report on it and talk about to other Asian American students who felt the same way. But... At the same time, I had this, this fear of writing on behalf of the entire Asian American community and how that would represent maybe my career in the future as a journalist. And being unbiased is, is the entirety of journalism to a certain extent. And it was completely out of my comfort zone at the time to speak on something so personal and vulnerable, uh, especially journalistically. And I, you know, because of that, I really disconnected myself from being the, the Asian writer, or I felt like I couldn't voice any thoughts about this, this uh, environment to people who didn't really get it um, from an outside perspective. They understood the severity of these incidents and as much as they could, but they never really had these, these personal stakes in it. And 
So my identity as an Asian American woman does impact how I approach approach reporting uh, despite this, but it impacts sort of the questions I ask and the stories I gravitate to. And my identity is something really concrete in my head. And I figured when I first entered journalism as a career and as a major, that I would have to just train myself to be unbiased and have this objectivity. But it's very important, I think, to recognize intersectionality and that it exists and how it shapes other people. And I think it makes you eventually a better writer and a better person. So I think it's vital to have events like this um, and more importantly, listen and listening to voices of other people and other stories that people have to share and allow them to educate other people and yourself. So that's really it for now. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Gaddis, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And to my fellow panelists, I am so very humbled to be uh, sharing this space and time with you. I'm also humbled and grateful for this opportunity to be a part of this community um, that's becoming. As Dr. Gaddis said, uh, I'm Shapewa Thomas. Um, lived in Alabama for 30 years this coming August. And it's been an interesting experience given the fact that I uh, was born in Tanzania, Dar es Salaam, East Africa, but grew up in Los Angeles, California, uh, and came here um, as a young adult to pursue um, my education at Tuskegee University and ended up staying. Um, and as a result of living here for a while, um, my experiences are varied. Uh, as Dr. Gaddis says, I wear a lot of hats, um, some we don't have time to talk about right now. But um, what's heavy on me at this moment is um, certainly the focus of our time together, as well as um, things that are going on in our world today. Um, my heart is heavy because even in this room, um, people are experiencing trauma. They have the lived experience of um, emotional distress and youth stress and uh, as a mental health professional, that's actually uh, the first place that um, my eyes, my ears, uh, my presence goes when it uh, comes in contact with others. Uh, it's also one that's really important to me because as a practitioner scholar, as a uh, community engaged scholar, as a public scholar, um, that at the very heart of my work um, is the health of people. And so when it comes to talking about becoming the beloved community, um, I don't think that we can do so without acknowledging um, and validating the lived experiences of all of us. And that includes certainly the trauma experiences of all of us. Um, I'm a counselor educator by discipline, clinical mental health counseling, um, but I'm also one that realizes that uh, counseling is just a part of uh, the overall holistic health um, process of healing that um, those of us on this life's journey uh, hopefully will encounter. And. Um, in my work as both an administrator, faculty, um, and person uh, living in this body at this time, in this space, um, in this community, um, I have to tell you that the things that I've learned um, about becoming have a whole lot to do with um, uh, how I can contribute and how others, I've learned how others contribute to us becoming. Um, and thinking about uh, Dr. Martin Luther King and his legacy and 
his philosophy and certainly those of others um, of this community that we carry forth with us. Um, I can't help but think about, um, again, the trauma that we are seeking to resolve um, through hope and, and healing. Um, and I've learned that um, one of the best ways, one of the best ways, one of the best ways to approach becoming and approach the coalition building and the work of helping us all heal is approaching it from a stance of cultural humility. Um, I can say this because not only uh, do I work with people or have worked with people who have experienced trauma uh, and utilized um, trauma-focused care practices, um, not only in my practice as a counselor, but certainly as an educator and one who helps faculty um, with some of the things that they encounter uh, in order to persist and do the work that they do. Um, is that it really starts with me listening uh, from a stance of humility. And um, I don't think that those are just words that we should toss around um, and not live, um, but they're words that I think we should embody if we're going to be about the work of helping ourselves and helping others heal. Cultural humility is really the process of self-reflection and discovery uh, that helps us to build honest and trustworthy relationships. And I think at the basis of us becoming and living in this world harmoniously, um, yeah, we've, we've got to think of the fact that it's about relationships. Um, I embody a relational leadership style. And um, any time that I do something, including this, which is having a conversation, um, I reflect on the importance of not only uh, talking, but more importantly, listening, which is a skill that those of us who talk don't always practice. <laughs> But I would submit to you that if it's about relationships, if, if it's about us coming together and becoming um, in the way that I think Dr. King would want us to, um, we need to embody that peace, that listening, so that we can comprehend. I think that that also means that we have to embody a, a um, so this is hard, um, embody a stance of, of vulnerability if we're gonna dare to become. Um, I think that as researchers, as scholars, um, as educators, as people, um, uh, ministers even of the message of, he of health and healing, um, we've gotta understand uh, cultural humility. To in eliminate health disparities, um, and certainly address uh, problems that are disturbing in our world um, and give attention and action intentionally on many levels, that that's the place that we should start. Um, or it's the place that we can exist in order to help. Um, and I have some other perspectives about that, but... Uh, um, in my 46 years of living, I've come to the conclusion that, yeah, in order to become myself, I've got to work with others uh, who are also becoming, realizing the fact that every individual comes to that experience um, with a unique set of, um, yeah, unique set of perspectives that I might not understand but in order for me to learn and to hear, um, I've got to approach it with humility. Uh, so I would submit and offer that to us today as we think about this time and space that we're going to be together um, and uh, look forward to the conversation.
Well, hello, good morning. My name is Linda Gibson Young. I'm from the College of Nursing here at Auburn University, and I am honored to be here today. Thank you, Dr. Harrell, for the invitation, and thank you for your mindset and putting us at a place today where, as she mentioned, we're not here by chance. We're here because we have a focus. We are here because we have words to share. We're here before, because we have things to listen to and learn from. So I'm just honored to be here today. So I'm a nurse. I'm a nurse practitioner. I've been serving for around 25 years. And my focus is on working with children. It's on connecting with children at the school level where they spend at least 40 hours per week. And when I get a chance to work with students, with work, when I get a chance to work with children, I learn something new every single day. They continuously teach me, they talk to me about learning and growing and becoming. And that's why I'm here today, is just to share information that I know from a child level, from working with children, from listening to children, from connecting with them on an everyday basis. It's my goal, it's my passion, and it's what I've been placed on this earth to do. So I focus a lot on children in the school system. Uh, most of them are seven to 12 years of age in the elementary school level, and they have a lot for us to learn from. They have a lot of new thoughts and new ideas, and they share their information, what they know and where they wanna be and where they wanna grow. But because I get to work with children, I get to continuously see a positive light and see what tomorrow might bring with new thoughts, new ideas. Uh, I work with children that might have a chronic condition. You see asthma affecting about 10% of our population. We see mental health disorders now affecting over 40% of our population at the child level. It's insightful. It allows me to sit back and really listen and learn from them. So I'm hoping to be able to share some of those thoughts today. So from the College of Nursing level, we are out in the communities. I say we impact around seven counties in this eastern Alabama area. And we learn from other counties. We learn from Chicago. We learn from Philadelphia and what they're doing um, with uh, children with chronic conditions, what we see with mental health um, impacts in the classroom. We're able to address health disparities by working as an interdisciplinary level. And uh, that is going to include some topics of conversation today, intergenerational, interfaith, and all how what we do together can impact the children inside the school systems. Children are vulnerable populations. Children are vulnerable because of their age. They're vulnerable because they don't have a lot of say-so in the everyday um, things that happen in their lives. They have families that are impacted by COVID or impacted by financial um, conditions that they bring home. They're children that live inside the homes that are impacted by substances, by substance abuse from their parents, by substance abuse from the people that are around them. And these children are vulnerable, and it's important for us to recognize that we have a lot to do for the vulnerable population of children. So I want to talk today about exploring, working together, connecting with what we have inside this room, as well as what can we do from today to carry outside this room? What can we do? What are our action steps? Because the College of Nursing doesn't have all the answers but we know that we can learn from each other and we can build and become what we need to do for our communities, for our children. So I'm glad to be here today. I look forward to the conversation. When we talk about uh, community uh, and, and I'm uh, as guilty, I don't know, as anyone else of this, I think, that we often give it a positive connotation. Um, and, and certainly I think of that in my work and think of myself as a, as a community historian. That's what I do, working with, uh, working with folks to tell their stories, especially people who've been marginalized by the processes of, of my profession, of history. Um, but I think there's also this 
corollary, this this sort of inversion of, of community that we have to think about as well. And the communities that we find ourselves in, uh, either by birth, circumstance, whatever, uh, that are very much in the process of, of becoming, uh, that are very much in the process of of, of healing and moving away from their their historical roots. And I think specifically as someone who comes from the South, who grew up in the South, uh, about the communities that we live in and how imbricated, how entangled they are uh, with, with cultures of, of white supremacy. So I've just finished writing a book um, uh, it's called uh, Gruesome Looking Objects, and it is a study uh, uh, about material culture, about things, and about things that come from lynching. And this, this quote up here, I'll read it out loud, and the, you can read it, certainly, uh, comes from the lynching of, of Tom Johnson and Joe Kaiser, Concord, North Carolina, 1898. Souvenirs of different kinds were taken by the crowd, such as pieces of the ropes, limbs, parts of the clothing, etc. This is, as you'll see in a moment, not an all uncommon practice uh, as, as part of, of lynching. Virtually every one of the thousands of lynchings that occurred, not only in the American South, but, but across much of this country and indeed beyond, uh, people would come. Uh, either uh, during the lynching or uh, immediately after, afterward, and collect these souvenirs, these mementos of, of the lynching. And this particular uh, lynching is one that hits really close to home for me. These two men uh, um, were lynched in the community that I grew up in. Um, and indeed, they were lynched in the churchyard of the small uh, rural Lutheran church that I grew up attending. Uh, and this is not something I knew growing up, growing up, um, not something I'd ever heard about, uh, and not something I discovered until about half a dozen years ago when I was uh, in graduate school. And um, that is something that uh, I've spent almost every waking hour for the next, for the for these past six years thinking about and trying to reconcile, right? And and doing that for a number of reasons because again, this is this is a small community that I grew up in, uh, and and I was one of the the very few young people that attended this church, and I was babied, right, by these, these older women in their 80s and 90s when I was growing up, and I was in 1980s and 1990s. Uh, these women were 80, 90, even 100 years old. And for me and my siblings, they treated us like their surrogate grandchildren, right? When we'd have dinner on the grounds, they would bring us, you know, an extra helping of macaroni and cheese or, um, you know, another slice of pie or whatever, right? We were the kids of this community. And, and this is a place that I, that I ran around, had a lot of, of, of fun, right? Uh, and, and how do I reconcile that? both being in that place where these men were, were brought to be tortured and killed and knowing these people, uh, perhaps whose brothers, fathers, grandfathers uh, participated in this mob, perhaps uh, who their brothers, fathers, uh, grandfathers, sisters, mothers, were some of the people that took souvenirs from this lynching. Uh, that took those scraps of clothing, pieces of the rope, bits of cloth, or pictures, many other things. Uh, and, and, and that is something, right? That is a community that I belong to as well, right? That is a community that, uh, that, that I have to uh, reconcile with my own upbringing and my own understanding of, of the past. And I just want to point out, too, that this is a, a much broader practice, right? This is a piece of rope uh, from, from the lynching of Matthew Williams in Maryland. 
um, around uh, 1912, uh, kept in uh, the National Museum of uh, uh, African American History and Culture. This is uh, uh, a stereoscopic image. This man right here, Henry Hilliard, uh, was lynched in, um, in uh, Tyler, Texas. Uh, 1907, I think it's, uh, oh, 1897, I'm sorry, it's wrong. Uh, and this was one of a series of 16 cards uh, that were sold in shops. This particular one was sold in a, uh, uh, a this is a Breckenridge and Scruggs um, uh, pharmacy, and others were sold in other, in other pharmacies and things like that around, around, around Texas and distributed throughout. And these were things that people used um, not only to, to uh, remember this lynching, right, but to tell about it, to share in that telling of it uh, with their friends and neighbors. For those who don't know what a stereograph, a stereoscope does, it's a sort of uh, early example of a uh, kind of a television this is so this image is repeated. You put it into a viewer, look inside of it, and then you project yourself into this scene. So that's what people were doing with this, right? They were projecting themselves into this scene as a, as a piece of enjoyment, a piece of entertainment. Uh, and so these are the kind of objects that I have uh, spent many years now writing and thinking and researching about and thinking about how people use them to remember how people use them to tell and and what these things meant to them right what their participation in what their relationship to this was uh, and it's something that i'm still still figuring out and something that i hope we'll talk some more about today but i but i i don't want to end completely on that uh on that note right uh, I also want to open up space for the possibility of different kinds of remembering. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and I want to do it specifically with this, um, with this quill, which is um, currently on display. I think it's still on display, is that right? Okay. Currently on display in the object lab um, uh, over here. I hope you'll go look at it and uh, generously on loan from uh, the Montgomery Museum of, of Fine Arts, just up the road, which I encourage all of you to visit um, as well. And this is a quilt made about 1950 by a woman named Catherine Somerville in Pickens County, Alabama. Uh, and it's made, if you can't tell, it's made of old clothes. It's made of clothing uh, that she took from her her brothers, her father, other folks she might have known in the community, right? These black men. Uh, and, and she and her siblings, her family, all, uh, uh, she was born around the turn of the 20th century. She had many brothers who were as well. And they came up in a time in the South. Uh, they came up in a time in Alabama. They came up in a time in Pickens County. Of, of particular violence uh, and particular racial violence. Pickens County uh, from the end of Reconstruction to the early 20th century had, I don't my notes in front of me, but only had 17 lynchings. Two of them were during uh, the life of Catherine Somerville and the, these two men, Sam Meeks and Poe Hibbler, who were killed were almost the same age as Catherine Somerville, almost the same age as her brothers, her, these, these men from whom these worn out clothing uh, was taken and transformed into this, this work of, of art, this work of remembrance. And so when I look at this quilt, I don't just think about Catherine Somerville and her artistry. I don't just think about the, the men uh, whose clothing that she she took and made into this piece of art, made into this beautiful memorial. I also think about Sam Meeks and Poe Hibbler and about the many, many other men, Pickens County and Alabama, uh, across the South and across the nation uh, who died, who were, who were murdered and uh, who perhaps did not have that 
memorial object, did not have these kind of remembrances of them. And so I, I like to think of this as something that stands in, and in a small way, uh, for, for those lives that were lived and, and lost. And so I'm going to end there. Um, and, and I want to kind of continue our conversation here, uh, thinking about some of the, the broad themes that we brought up today. And uh, it is it's so, again, as I, as I open today with, it's so, uh, such a privilege to be able to do this, to be able to sit here and talk with these folks, uh, and a privilege to think about how these things sort of come together. And, you know, something that I noticed, uh, and I love when these kind of conversations, right, from, from those of us who seem so far afield, but something that I noticed everybody uh, saying today uh, and in really powerful ways uh, were about the acts, and, and, and I say that really intentionally, the acts of telling and listening, and, and how we think of those as, as these processes embedded in our work, right? And I think when we talk about that, when we often say telling, listening, whatever, I think we often are not uh, thinking of it in, in, in an active way, right? As something that we have to intentionally undertake. And so I was so grateful to each of you today for really, uh, whether you knew it or not, building on that, that theme that, that, uh, and building on each other's thoughts and comments there. And so I, I wanted to kind of open our conversation today by asking you in, in whatever order we want, we don't need to keep our order anymore, uh, uh, to talk a little bit more about the, the act of the power of telling and listening in your own, in your own work. And so I'll sort of open it to whoever, whoever wants to, whoever wants to talk. I can go first okay. if that's okay. Thanks. Just uh, I work with children in asthma, I mentioned. We hold a summer asthma camp. And when I first arrived in 2016, I came from Texas to Alabama. I had the opportunity to sit down and, and ask questions about starting the camp. And it was early that I recognized I need to listen more with this community before we implement a camp. So we dove in and just jumped into the school system and said, what would you like to see when it comes to a camp? And I had many parents say, these are our children. We're not going to just up and give them to you to spend the night at Children's Harbor, at, which is at uh, Children's Hospital's foundation site at Lake Martin. And so, you know, we slowed down. We said, let's do a day camp and let's bring children. And so we worked on transportation and getting children into um, the lake setting. And we just took our time and really listened and engaged with the families. And I heard so many times people come in for two years and they leave. So we don't want you to do that. We don't want you to just come in, hold a camp for two years while it's covered under a grant and leave. That was never, you know, my intention with camps. But I needed to hear that, that the people in our communities see Auburn University or any higher education as a place where they might come in and hold a project for two years and that's it. And so we're, we don't want to do that. We need to listen and hear the community. We need to partner. We need to show up year after year and continue this camp when we start a camp like this. And so we did. We had, that we're now in our fifth year. We have moved it to a spend the night camp this year. So if you are free in July and you want to show up, we will be at Lake Martin with hopefully 50 children that are living with asthma. But we have to show up. We have to be there year after year and partner with the communities and listen to them and engage to see what they want of our camp experiences. We can't just come in and hold a camp and then leave when we run out of money. And that is so important for people to hear. We might think, oh, I don't do that. But time and time again across this state, from higher education, we've done that. So that is just one example of a way that we've got to show up 
We've got to continuously be there. And nursing is often known as the number one most trusted profession. We've heard it year and year for 18 different years. But I need to teach our students about showing up, about listening, about engaging in the communities that we are working with. So when we have nurses inside the hospital, we can't expect that we understand what our communities are like. So when we're doing discharge plannings and we're sending people home from the hospital or sending people home from the emergency room, we don't understand what their life is like on a daily basis until we engage with the communities. So that's just one example that I wanted to start us off with how to listen to our communities, how to engage, and how we don't have all the answers. I'd like to add on to that. Um, Linda, you said something really significant. Um, in the telling and the listening um, and being intentional about it, uh, I think that requires us to realize um, that that's a commitment to um, not a time-limited engagement. Um, that the work may require us to go beyond maybe how we're conceptualizing a project, right? Because it's not so much about the project or the work, although the action's important, it's about the people. Um, in, in my work in, in, in counseling and certainly preparing mental health professionals, um, we talk a lot about the telling and the listening because that's essentially um, what has to happen for counseling to really be successful. Um, the practitioner works with a client or a consumer, um, and the consumer comes to the counselor with an issue, with a problem, and the counselor, through skilled, um, uh, skilled practice, works to um, help that client elicit their participation um, in their own healing process uh, through talk therapy to um, affect change uh, in a way in which that will be most meaningful uh, for them. So the mechanism of counseling is the telling and the listening. Um, you can't do it successfully without both. Um, and so it requires vulnerability on both sides um, and a willingness to be in it, to commit right, um, to be all in, <laughs> if you will. Um, and, and I think the same is true on a, uh, not just the micro level, but a macro level with, um, with community. Uh, and that is that um, we, we should be uh, committed to hearing each other, um, not always being the one that uh, wants to talk about the expertise that we bring to the table, but acknowledging the expertise that exists at the table. And that's um, embodied by all of us. Um, and that sometimes takes a while, right? Um, because talking about it and hearing about it, telling our truths and sharing our truths um, requires time. So I would just like to lift an echo um, that intentional engagement, intentional commitment to community work or working together absolutely positively requires us to um, share even the stuff that's uh, hurtful, uh, that we don't want to expose or that we're embarrassed about. Um, I think actually that that is a place where healing can begin, reconciliation can begin, and continue um, to develop. Um, and that's in, in terms of the healing um, um, mechanism of the telling and the listening uh, is so very pivotal to uh, to the work that the work that we all do. I think regardless of the discipline. Um, Yeah, absolutely. I really agree with a lot that Dr. Thomas said, especially about vulnerability and the relationship between um, a counselor and patients, you know, 
And I, in terms of journalism, it's very similar. And there's this quote, I don't know if I'm making it up. I think it, it, it's real somewhere. I can't be the first person to say this, but it was it's saying, are you listening or are you just waiting until you can talk? And I think that that's so significant for journalists uh, it, on an interview uh, in regards to interviewing because I definitely think when I first started interviewing, it was so formulaic and it's so there's so much stress to get the information you need and you feel this pressure to just get everything you need to cover covered. And it was much less conversational, but I think as I've progressed and learned more skills and developed my voice and writing and what I want to convey, you realize it's much more conversational and it's it's more of a give and take as well. People do feel more comfortable when you're talking to them if you are willing to also give them something about yourself. And as opposed to just you being an active listener, it's much more transactional than that. Um, so that's, that's and all of my answers are going to be somehow journalism centric because at the ripe age of 21, that's my entire life. <laughs> so <laughs> um, that's really my, my biggest point of reference here. Um, but absolutely, listening and telling is a very difficult skill to have, especially in a professional field, because you just feel so, you feel this pressure to, to get everything you want to get. And even in, in instances where you're interviewing people who are sharing trauma with you and sharing things with you that are serious, you want them to feel that it's not just an interview, right? You And it'll translate in your writing and in your articles and in the art that you put out with it, um, that there was a relationship there and there is this sense of care. And um, yeah, that's really it. But I did really agree with both of what you guys said. All right, I'm gonna attempt to practice the vulnerability that we talked about and tell you all that um, when I started my doctoral work, my project looked at this idea of having a calling, which I feel like I don't really have to define. Often people have a good idea of what it means to be called to do something, whether that calling is coming from God or whether that calling is maybe not religious, but pushing you towards a certain occupation. And specifically, I was interested in how immigrants felt that. And I am a second generation immigrant. My parents are both immigrants from Mexico. And when I started this project, before I even collected data, I felt like I had the results written. I was like, I know everything. I know what the themes are going to be. And my dissertation was completely different, the findings, because um, obviously in talking to other people, they're going to have different experiences. And so a lot of that was tied to learning how to listen. Um, but also another thought I had is in my interviews, I talked to a lot of people who felt like they weren't being listened to. And that just ties to being in a vulnerable place in society. Um, a lot of the people I spoke to said something very similar and it was a variation of, and also to provide some context, these were a lot of the, the second generation immigrants I spoke to were often in primarily white schools. They were sent to these schools because they, their parents had this perception that they were you know, better schools. And they often said to me things like, I feel too Mexican to be white and too white to be Mexican or too Dominican to be white, too white to be Dominican. And so I, um, after talking to them, I interpreted that they uh, weren't necessarily being, I guess, listened to um, as they were having this cultural struggle, either from the broader community or even within their families, because they had that expectation to, you know, continue to um, I guess, reproduce their culture while also uh, engaging with this new culture. Um, and so that space that they were in was often not spoken about and they were just kind of expected to exist. And for a lot of people, I think I was the first person who really, you know, dove into this with them. Mm -hmm. So a little bit of a different take, but I yeah. hope that contributes. I'm also a second generation immigrant and I definitely understand where they're coming from. You know, growing up in a predominantly white area as well, you know, I almost thought I could pass and trick people that I wasn't this culturally very Asian person with a name like mine. But um, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I completely understand where they're coming from there. And feeling listened to, that's hard enough, you know, as a, you know, a teen. But um, 
when you're also dealing with feeling listened to about issues such as immigration or assimilation, mm -hmm. it's nearly impossible. So. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of what you were saying in your opening uh, speech there mm -hmm. really resonated with what, with what I've heard in my work. Mm -hmm. I want to acknowledge just really quickly how mm -hmm. validating it is uh, to be heard. Um, and just to echo what you both have just said about, I guess, just the, and want to lift just how important it is uh, to listen, right? Because we, we, we as people um, sometimes live in silence <laughs> about the things that we go through and uh, don't always have the form or even take the opportunity, um, um, even in, in, in a moment's uh, notice, like when you have the uh, opportunity to share, but maybe feel reticent to do so. Um, and, and I want to also lift the fact that it's, it's also not easy to be vulnerable. Um, I'm, I'm actually sitting here at this very moment uh, to model this, um, thinking about my maternal great-great-grandfather um, who uh, was tarred, feathered, and lynched in Arkansas. And just remembering, like forcing myself to turn around and and look at the object or the image that you had, uh, Dr. Gaddis, on the screen. And um, just sitting here processing um, that intergenerational uh, mem mem memory and even um, the pain that that evokes for me, just sitting here, um, thinking about the fact that a member of my family experienced that, lost his life that way. Um, or even for the first time going to the Legacy Museum um, and seeing Lee County, Arkansas, that pillar, uh, and going with my mother and my mother weeping, even though his name wasn't listed or, you know, but just seeing the physical representation of those individuals that were, um, they experienced a terror lynching uh, that were recorded and um, how even I've had to face my own um, post-traumatic um, uh, experience with that intergenerational trauma that I think um, I carry around and walk around with me in this body, in this space, in this time, um, living uh, this life. And just to acknowledge the fact that, okay, that's not just something I carry around. There's all of us. Um, have something like that in our background, something, anything. Maybe it's something that we didn't experience, but somebody we know. Maybe there's some vicarious trauma that we've experienced. Um, but, but just wanted to acknowledge uh, and truth tell that, um, yeah, that's the stuff that we bring to bear every day that we go to work, that we live our lives, that in terms of the telling and the listening within our families, even the stuff that we don't tell, the things that we harbor and uh, don't share um, and don't speak to. Um, but when we do have the opportunity to speak about it, um, how very, very significant it is then to be heard. Um, how very therapeutic <laughs> it can be. Uh, to be heard. Um, so I would just simply like to lift that, that if you have the opportunity, um, even in a small way, even the acknowledgement of an object, um, um, yeah, that to validate that by listening or to validate it by noticing it. Um, yeah, I hope you don't mind Kevin, I met you earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, he said something about the trees that he noticed this morning. And that resonated with me because I, I thought about how looking at trees um, for some people years and years ago, say 50 years ago, 60 years ago, was not a pleasant thing. It was something that evoked fear, a fear response or an anxious response versus seeing a tree blow in the wind um, is beautiful, or how it could exist as both. 
Um, something that maybe generationally I may remember is where my great grandfather hung from. But yet when I look at it blowing in the wind um, simultaneously, I can also acknowledge it as something beautiful. Uh, so anyway, I just had that imagery come up from you and your comment to me earlier, to Dr. Linda Gibson Young and I earlier. Um, uh, and I, I wanna just acknowledge and appreciate um, and, and that I heard you when you said that. I have a lot of other questions, but I, I feel the kind of necessity now to to ask a question that you know, that comes up occasionally in in these spaces, but maybe not enough, right? Which is, I think all of us think of our work as exceeding those those boundaries of of work, right? So you know, um, those of us who are professors are dictated by things like tenure grants you know, the need to publish, that kind of thing. Uh, our, our journalist colleague is has, has an even worse um, thing. She is dictated by the deadline, right? <laughs> but we keep doing this work, right? And we keep we, we keep going at it because we, we care about these communities and we want to be involved in them. And and we want to tell them that we're we're there for them. Maybe the institution is not, and I want to talk about that later too. Uh, that we represent, maybe it's not there, but but we are. Um, but I also, you know, I, I, I'm also uh, mindful of the fact that that is that's it's a it is a big burden for us too, right? And as much as being in community and doing this work is uplifting, as much as it is rewarding, uh, all these things, it is also it is also something that is that is so that can be draining. And I, and I know this, especially the case for for so many uh, activists, especially right. We have we have seen in this past ten or fifteen years the the weight that that has had on people with uh, with you know up to up to in um, uh, deaths and suicides, right? And so I just wanted to think a little bit about how, or ask you all to think about, um, reflect on. Um, ethics and practices of self-care and how we how we embed that <laughs> how we embed that into this work right and how we make sure that we are doing that uh and foregrounding that in these communities that we work with as as well so whoever wants to start I know dr thomas has thoughts on this but uh <laughs> no, i'm always have something yeah to say it's kind of it's that, kind man. of a, you know you're the ringer in this in this case but that's uh, but we don't have to start with you i'm glad for other folks to jump in if they'd like yeah, I guess I uh, have a few thoughts on that. So, um, like Mai said, uh, with you know all your responses being about journalism, all of mine are going to be about immigration. Um, so, when I was a doctoral student, I was very much like, we've got to you know go to all the marches, go to the demonstrations. I would teach, right, and then I would. I spent several afternoons working with an immigrant rights organization after work. Um, a very, looking back now, unsustainable way of living because my work was about immigration, my extracurriculars were about that, and so eventually I just uh, kind of burned out. And it wasn't until maybe like a year ago where I started realizing that I didn't have to volunteer for everything. Um, someone once, and I, and I wish I could remember where I heard this, but someone used the metaphor of like an orchestra if you ever listen to an orchestra, you can't quite tell when someone like pauses to take a breath because there's other people to kind of pick it up. And they said that activist work should be kind of like that. So right now I'm kind of in that breath. I've, uh, um, I'm also very fortunate. I'm not teaching this semester. So I've uh, kind of taken the time to explore some of my own interests. And I think um, for a while, at least for me, there was sort of a stigma associated with resting that I'm learning to break out of. Um, yeah. yeah, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I clearly love what I do and enjoy being completely engrossed in it. I don't look at my role as a nurse as a job. It's just what I am and what I do. It's my identity. And self-care is 
priority with being a role model, being out in the community. And I can, uh, we hold a school-based health education intervention called Tiger Chat, where every single um, Wednesday, the College of Nursing is out in the community. We screen, but we also educate children about healthy behaviors. So we talk about nutrition, physical activity, and we also address emotions and other health topics like oral health and sleep. But without me getting the right amount of sleep or me eating the right type of foods or, uh, or exercising 60 minutes a day, which is what we encourage all children, 60 minutes a day every single day, I don't need to be standing up in front of children talking about this. So I try to say to all our nurses, if we're going to educate it about it, we need to be doing it. Yeah. And I'm, so we've got yeah, to walk yeah. the walk. I'm, I'm going to quickly, because yes. it's not fair for me to uh, ask the questions and I'd answer them too. Yes. But, but I'm going to say this is something that I struggle with a lot, right? Um, and, and I think, you know, more and more I'm trying to be intentional about this because you know, when, when you work in community and, and I think, I think part of it is about modeling, right. And learning from them. And, and so much of what we do when we're working in these communities, right. When, when we give and give and give and give, right. I feel like then they feel this obligation too, right. Which is never, which is not, which is not what you want in that relationship. And so, yeah, I'm, I've been thinking a lot about this lately, which is selfishly why I asked it, right? Uh, about how we, about how we do this, right? How we, how we actually build these healthy, sustainable relationships, right? And I think, I think partially that model of self-care is a way of saying, you know, this is not, no, no matter how close you are to these folks, right? It can feel transactional, but, but saying, you know, saying, you know, let's let's just grab lunch together and not talk about work. <laughs> Whatever is is maybe a way of, of beginning to model actually a, a deepening of those of those relationships. And I think that then gets back to that other that other big thing that we're talking about here, right? About how you stay involved past the deadline, mm -hmm. past the grant, that sort of thing. So so yeah, I, I want others to respond to, but I just want to make sure I'm not I'm not just <laughs> up here uh, listening or uh, you know talking. The, the sort of biggest piece of advice I'm constantly given as someone who's trying to pursue a career in journalism is to learn how to separate, you know, your work life from your personal life. Um, and admittedly, admittedly, I don't know how to do that. Um, some of my closest friends are my colleagues and also journalists, and we do tend to talk about um, news a lot and paper a lot. And when you're in a field that is so competitive and driven by deadlines and getting things out before other people and doing it the best, you become very careerist. And this is this is this is vulnerable of me, but um, so I've got one of look one of my friend Destiny. She's over there. She is the EIC of the paper, and we have caught ourselves in moments where we hear something so human and so personal and vulnerable, and we think. <laughs> And we think that would be a great story. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and that's, yeah, and you're just, and because yep. you just, and it's, it's, it's terrible, obviously, but it's, it's so hard to separate um, when that's your entire life, really. And you do these things from Monday to Friday, and then you leave, and then you hang out with the same people from Monday to Friday. So self care is great. Um, and I would love to start doing it. <laughs> I would. You, you know, I, I, I think you are. Yeah. I think you are, though. Mm -hmm. um, I've struggled with that yeah. all of my career. Also because I'm, I'm one of those persons that just, I'm interested in everything. And so I'm very scattered, <laughs> admittedly, um, because I want to follow every trail. I want to, I'm curious. And um, there have come points in my life when I've realized, no, you can't follow. No, you can be curious and you can hold space for that. But right now we need to focus on this. Um, I, I would submit that I'm actually in a point in my career now where um, my work life is actually very much 
integrated to my personal life just because of my passions and the things that I care about. Um, and, and whereas I do believe that there needs to be boundaries that we, we set for what we consider work and personal, um, where they're integrated and where we want to be, want them to be integrated is also up to us. And I also think that there's skill in being intentional the same way we are about work, being intentional about the other passions of our life, you know, the things that um, pour into us to help us um, like sleep, uh, gain restoration and to be uh, reinvigorated and um, uh, whatever that that is, I, I think that we should be doing it, certainly, as long as it doesn't hurt other people or hurt ourselves. Um, so in terms of an, an ethic for or even learning how to do the self-care thing, um, I, I, I think that if we think about keeping um, or working at getting ourselves to a place of equilibrium, or balance and whatever that looks like. For some of us, that'll take some time to learn because our lives are so dynamic. Um, I know recently I've been, um, this is gonna be sacrilegious, a faculty member to say this. <laughs> but, sorry, um, I've been rejecting the whole notion of grind culture. Yeah, that's, that's you don't say that in, in the academy though. <laughs> Even at my level as a, as a full professor, that I'm supposed to be publishing, I'm supposed to be writing, I'm supposed to be doing this, I'm supposed to be going here, I'm supposed to be doing all of this. But at some point, I'm, I'm looking at my life like, okay, is this it? Mm, no, there are other things that I'm really interested in and curious about that I want to pursue. So I want to, I just want to lift um, and validate that yes, self-care is really important. Um, but I think that that needs to be aligned with our becoming. After faculty engagement um, is about being fortified myself as a tool for the work. Uh, and if I'm not, just like Dr. Linda Gibson Young was saying, um, and if you're not perspective taking, doing some of that reflexivity along the way, um, you might not have the insight into your own issues to determine if a change needs to be made uh, in this area or not to, um, to be more uh, caring of yourself. Um, I'd also like to submit that it's good to give ourselves grace. Um, we're becoming, so therefore we're not there yet. Um, yeah, so we're learning, we're growing. Um, I don't think that should be an excuse for not doing but um, sometimes the not doing times helps us to do more. Not more in terms of volume, but more in terms of Im impact. Um, I'd also think that um, that's where listening is really important because sometimes other people know how to do this care thing better than we do. And even those of us who have expertise in certain areas uh, could stand to learn some practices from some indigenous people. Um, <laughs> um, when it comes to going back to the earth and things that help us to live naturally. Um, yeah, I, and like embracing eight hours of sleep, for example. Versus saying, I'll sleep when I'm dead. Well, yeah, you're going to hasten yourself <laughs> to die if you don't sleep, right? I mean, that's something really small, but so significant. Because rest, for example, is restorative. Um, so, yeah, I... Um, 
I just want to, um, yeah, validate that, that those things are just so keenly important to our living. Um, and those of us who struggle with balancing it do so, I think, because um, in the world in which we live, right, the things that we have around us that pressure us um, to do the antithesis of that which is healthy. Um, we need to set up maybe some boundaries uh, to help ourselves live more fully and better. Um, if everybody in the room feels like Dr. Thomas is talking directly to you, because yeah. she was. Uh, I'm talking but, to uh, <laughs> Uh, but I do want to, I, I promised we would do this, and, we, uh, and, and we're having such a rich conversation, and I really want to bring folks out here into it. So um, I'd love uh, if anybody in the audience has a question for, for the whole panel, for individuals, whatever, to, to kind of open this up. And uh, if you do, just kind of raise your hand, and, and Chris will come around and, and pass a microphone to you. Hi. Hi. Hi, my name is Alexandria Smith. I attend Tuskegee University. Um, and I am also from Los Angeles, California. Really? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> so my question is actually directed towards you. It's, it's more of a comment question. Um, so as I said before, I do attend Tuskegee University and Tuskegee holds so much significance in American history. Um, basically with the Tuskegee Airmen and even um, the Tuskegee Civilist Trials. Um, so one thing that stood out to me um, when you opened was that you were focusing on trauma. Um, I've heard that word a lot today. Um, and one thing I can say is that trauma shapes us individually and as a community. Um, and recently, uh, one of our students, uh, Reginald T. Summage, he passed away on March 18th after being shot. Um, at Tuskegee by one of Tuskegee's community members. Um, this brought light to a major issue within our community, number one, that students don't have access to 24-hour medical hospitals and assistance. Number two, that our police department lacks ethics. Number three, our university lacks care. And number four, that our city community lacks resources and true understanding within the matter because the state of Alabama does not offer enough funding to a city that brought so much to America. Um, this left my peers traumatized. We feel unsafe and uncared for. So my question for you and the rest of the panel today is, how can we use trauma to shape change within our community? I think you start with what you just did. Um, speaking your truth. Um, I think healing begins um, with acknowledging when something happens and then not working by yourself to help that healing process to continue. Um, if you're, especially if you're unable to address it by yourself. Um, I actually think it's a, it's a community responsibility. It's not just one of us. Although one of us can start, can be a catalyst for any change. Um, but I think it's the collective uh, that helps any one of us um, yeah, address those things that hurt one of us. Um, MLK said that, well, not exactly that, but um, what a threat to justice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Right? And that includes with each and every one of us as, as individuals. Um, that's probably not a, a direct answer to your question, but I think it's a, it's a way to start. Extremely proud of your question, your conversation, your starting. 
saying we need to move. We need to move forward on this. And I think this, the way you stated that question was, was key and you did it and I'm proud of you for that. We need to have more movement, more conversation. I would say the relationship with Auburn University and Tuskegee University needs to be moved forward. And that as well, we're in close proximity. We've got to address that. Yeah, I mean, I think just to just just to say that into, you know, part of what we said we would talk about today, right, is is holding Auburn responsible, right? And we don't want to pretend like Auburn can go in and solve um, problems. But but Auburn also is an enormously well resourced place, um, especially in terms of things like like healthcare, right? And in, in a way that that Tuskegee um, has, I don't want to say is not right, but has 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 been disinvested in so that it is not. And I think I think that's exactly, yeah, maybe part of where it begins, right? Is is what is what we can do, right? Um, it, it, to marshal the resources of this place um, that has, as, as you said, so powerfully, right? Um, that has that has taken from and has has gotten a lot from Tuskegee, right? A place that has given so much to to Alabama and to the specific the specific area around here, um, but but has not had a lot given back to it. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm curious to know if you think if if there's an answer you have to that yeah. question. Yeah. How can we use trauma to, as Pearl Cleese says in one of her poems, turn the ships around? Um. I, I've had this conversation with a few of my peers, um, and it's not that Tuskegee students don't care because they have really, like, it makes me, like, really sad, but they have been trying to invoke change within our community for such a long time. Mm -hmm. um, students, and then it's, it's crazy to me, too, that they basically move on and you know, sometimes it feels like things are being left behind because they move on with their lives. And so now it's left to another student to carry on basically what their work was. But um, I really don't, I, I really don't know what we can do aside from having conversations. Uh, I told one of my peers, he basically told me that he's gone to the Tom, town hall meetings he spoke with with people who ha are like directly in touch with the actual government um and he basically said that every question that i had he said no mm -hmm. people are so comfortable with being complacent and people don't want change essentially and once we you get the answer no it's really hard for them to move forward um, but one thing that i can say is that I'm not that type of person. And I won't allow a no to be my final answer. So I just said, well, can we reach out to other students? This is not the first student who's passed away. I've been at Tuskegee since 2017 and a student has passed away each semester I've been there. Whether or not it's from going back home and being involved with something uh, within their own personal community or whether or not it's been them actually being on campus. A year ago, a student went missing. Well, he was no longer a student for a semester. He was a previous student. But he went missing and nobody cared. Nobody cared at all. And he was my friend. So eventually they found his body. Um, but it just seems like if we don't try to create some type of change, then it'll continuously happen. And I don't, I don't want to see a 20-year-old kid pass away who hasn't even experienced life at all, like never had any, any type of experiences. So with that being said, um, I guess the, the basic way to start change or invoke change is to have a conversation and not let no be your final answer. Good morning to all of you. It may be afternoon by this time, I'm not sure. But my name is Will Thomas. I'm a doctoral student in the Department of History here 
Uh, my question, well, first I had a comment was about just the impact of truth telling, um, like we've all talked about here is so paramount, you know, especially in regards to the precarious details about a past that it may reveal. Speaking in this moment from being African-American, there's so much about African-American history we still don't know. Um, and it's so much to still silence that my job, that my work um, as a professor soon will, you know, is to uncover these truths, you know, and even in light now, getting, uh, preparing to teach my first world history class, I'm wondering just how much of this truth telling um, will be embraced and how much will be regarded as too much. So, um, and I think that's a very real um, summation of that, uh, especially <laughs> in light of, you know, now government mandates on what you can say, um, not real, you know, not realizing, uh, not so much of who's going to affect, but what we still are willing to cover up. So how do we create these larger spaces um, on a national level for truth telling? I'll let anybody that starts, or anybody that wants to start, start. <laughs> I would submit that there are communities um, in existence already where that truth telling is being told. Um, I myself, for example, did not um, have maybe as full of, a, uh, of an awareness or an education um, in, say, DEI or um, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion work, say, growing up, even though both of my parents were pretty progressive, um, revolutionary thinking individuals. Uh, my mother's actually a former panther. Uh, my dad was a follower of, of Marcus Garvey and Richard Wright's writings. Um, actually, you know, left the United States, wanted to live in Africa for a while. Um, my mom was a graduate of Sarah Lawrence College and wanted to get an education at the University of Dar es Salaam and at a fashion show. That's where they met, married, and then had me. <laughs> Um, but I'll tell you, when I first started pursuing my education, I, I, didn't, um, I didn't know the work of those scholars or even the communities that were having conversations about, um, you know, social justice as we know those terms and have, have, have learned about other things like microaggressions and macroaggressions and that kind of things. And, you know, I, I, I didn't have that lexicon, so I had to learn it. Um, and I had to become a student of it. So part of that was inserting myself in places where I could learn more. The other piece that um, was encouraged by my parents was um, to read about it become a, a self, um, to engage in self-study. Um, and so I would, I would submit that there are, there are communities um, where we can learn this information. There are seminars, there are conferences, there are spaces like this one that we can engage in and come to, um, to uncover stories. There are books like Dr. Gaddis's book that we can read. Um, to become more knowledgeable and, um, yeah, much more educated in maybe the ways in which we don't have or lack awareness. Yeah, other responses? I was going to say right here. Yeah. This is the beloved community, which means much love. And it was started with the intention of starting these conversations with an action plan after we leave this. I can't stress that enough. We can't just come in here. We've got to take it back and make action, move. And that's, you know, you, you ask the question about where can I talk, and this is the start. And you started that conversation. So let's keep those stories, that truth, that discussion happening, and not just after the, tomorrow, after this ends. 
it's got to continue on and we've got to move. So thank you for asking the question. Yeah, I just want to quickly say too that, um, you know, the emphasis that we've had today on telling and listening, um, I, I don't want to pretend that those are not, I think we emphasized them as active and as actions, right? Because, um, because we want to emphasize how, I don't want to say easy, but but that is that is the the barrier to entry, right? Beginning with with that, you know, that's not where we end, uh, but it seems to me that that is it, it's as again, it's not as easy as, but it is. It begins with that telling and listening as acts, right? That is actually an action toward that becoming, and I think that's. I just want to amplify what folks have been saying about that today. Chris, do we have time for one more? She's got one right here. Two more? We okay. probably have time for a couple more. Okay, a couple right. hands, and I'll see how many. Yeah, I know, I know we had one up here for a while. Okay. Over here? We, we will try to fit in a few we're gonna, more. We're, we're going to get both. We're going to get both. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chanel Rains. I am a psychology major at Governor State University. And my question to all of you all, um, is how have, during you all's journey, how have you all strategically provided safe space for people to be heard? Um, just a little background about me. I grew up on the South Side of Chicago, Inglewood. It's a lot of violence and my generation are looking for me for the answers. Um, I know that I am the first generation to go to college, um, my parents, one is a high school dropout, one is a college dropout. So I know before my mom passed, she just knew that you have to just be the answer because people are looking for you to be the answer. But I'm not a licensed counselor yet. <laughs> <laughs> I honor you, Dr. Thomas, yet, right? Yet, however, it is ways that I can be answered. So I want to know how you all doing your all's journey have been, been able to provide strategically safe space for people to be heard. And I thank you all for your time. Thank you. Yeah. I, can, uh, I can start. Um, and this isn't obviously the only solution, but I know that when I first started at Auburn, being so new, I wasn't a safe space with students. So a lot of it is relationship building. But when it comes to um, you know, dealing with students, I think I, I try to give them control of the situation, like that, let them decide how long we're gonna meet, whether the door's gonna be open or closed in this sort of format. Um, but I think it just, it's taken a while because people don't know you. Um, you know, looking at me, I understand that I'm not necessarily the first person a student might trust. So it's just letting it, um, letting that relationship build as part of it. Yeah, I'll, I'll add really quickly that um, part of my training is as an ethnographer um, so I do oral history, but but we uh, we learn in my training, right, that um, that recorders come very late in a relationship, and that and that you spend and it gets to a lot of these themes we've had today, right? That you spend that time to build build a relationship first before that comes before the work, right? And that's the thing that is more important than than the work. So yeah, Dr. Thomas and I talk about this often. Absolutely. <laughs> well, well, just because um, in the work of community engagement or public engagement, um, because relationships are so important um, and trust <laughs> building, uh, authenticity, and certainly the validation and vulnerability, all these things that we've been talking about today, um, that in uh, coalition building, right, one of the best practices is reciprocity and mutual benefit. And you don't know what someone's, what, what, why they're coming to the table, what they're hoping to gain until you actually sit down and talk with them and listen to what they have to say. But then that reciprocal action um, of then sharing or giving of information or truth telling is I think absolutely key to level setting or even establishing the relationship. Um, so in community work, um, certainly we create space by, for example, not mentioning the word research yeah. when we come into a space uh, to engage with a community. We, we want to find out what do you want? You know, what do you want to see for your community? When we talk to young people, um, 
we actually have a rural health project that we're working on right here uh, in the neighboring um, community of Lafayette, or Lafayette, Alabama, in Chambers County. And we've been talking about those best practices and how we enter in. One of the ways that I um, found out very early on in creating safe spaces for my students um, is to be other centric. Um, that even though I'm a professor and I even have the power, you know, to give a grade or, you know, to, you know, with the power of the red pen, that kind of thing, right? But trying to approach any interaction um, with the other in mind first, not myself, which is not self-centered, it's very other-centric, right? Um, and I think creating safe spaces, especially when you've had the experience of safe spaces not being created for you, and I'm speaking of myself, um, I, I'm not so far removed from the student experience that I, I have not forgotten what it feels like. So part of my ethos for my work is to make sure um, that in those interactions with people, including the faculty that I talk to and work with to, um, and to develop their own outreach programs, um, you know, that who they are as people, not just as professors or faculty, um, is in the room with them as we're together. And so that, that's an approach that, at, again, at the micro level, um, is also expressed at the, mac the macro when we're working in communities. I think that's one of the best ways to create safe spaces. Um, when people don't feel comfortable and don't feel like they feel safe to open up or to share or that they'll be, their experiences will be invalidated, then you know, that relationship building can't, I don't think, happen. And I'm sure as journalism or journal the field of journalism, right, you, there's, there's a way that you all have to talk to people, right? To sure, yeah. elicit their stories, to find out information, for them to go deeper. Um, right. Creating people, a space for which they want to share their stories. Yes, absolutely. People hate the press. And um, they also, and there's this tendency to think immediately when I reach out to someone and, you know, and I want to write something about them, something they've done, there is this tendency to feel a distrust and feel a little wary of, of what I will write about them, you know, and they request things like, you know, can I have the questions beforehand? Can I read the story before you put it out? You know, um, which journalistically, I just like, uh, sorry, no, but, um, but, Yes, it's it's super important to come in there and and make them feel comfortable and not just be like recording, et cetera, et cetera, like you mentioned. Um, but yeah, it, I would, it, you know, I don't know if I would go as far as to call it maybe creating the safe space. It is creating comfortability mm -hmm. um, for them to be vulnerable and to feel valued, and that I'm not just using them for a story. Um, but to also learn about their experiences. So that's very significant to to you know, like everyone has said so far, I'm just kind of echoing that to build this relationship um, on trust and on things like that. Yeah. I don't want to limit it on time. I just, yeah. oh, sorry. No, go ahead. From a child perspective, children are so amazing. They will shut off if they don't feel mm -hmm. comfortable. Yeah. And so I'm Nurse Linda and I show up and we're there every single Wednesday, 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 Wednesday. And that opens up this space for them to feel more comfortable to where they do share. There are children that go home on Friday and no one says, how was your week? Mm -hmm. Until Monday when they get back. And that's challenging for children, but they are able to share. And, and when you give them that relationship, when you continuously build that relationship, and it's two ways, it's not just one-sided, it's both. But by being there each Wednesday, I think it's, it, does allow for that um, safety. Yeah. Um, so I was just gonna say, I know from a personal level, I also pay attention to like the people that others associate, associate themselves with. Like if you've ever had the friend who has dated the sketchy person, that kind of makes you question them a little bit. I think about that as well, just thinking, you know, 
like um, who people are associated with. If you go, uh, I mean, as a student, if you see that someone works really closely with like the Office of Inclusion and Diversity or with certain people on campus, I think that can really help to set yourself up as someone who appears um, or who can provide that safe space for you. So thinking about those partnerships too and paying attention to how people affiliate themselves can be pretty useful. Let's try for one more we'll question one more. and then we can keep talking over lunch. Yeah. Yes, we'll be quick. Hello, I'm Lee Warren. And um, so as I heard you make your introductions, uh, one of the things, there were several things that st stood out for me. One was the question, what are our action steps? Um, I believe you asked that question. And so from our conversations today, I've learned about um, we have to intentionally listen. Um, we have to show up. <clears throat> we have to be open to change. But I also want to say something more about change, and that is that um, we have to be ready to rethink and relearn something that might change us. And then, of course, I have to put down self-care because <laughs> it's important because it's what, it, it's what prepares you for the work you have been given to do. So. I think that prompting toward, I'm really happy that's where you, you brought us, right? Because I think that that's what we want to, to end with in some ways. Uh, well, not end, begin with, begin again with, uh, thinking about what those, what those action steps are and where we go from here. And I think so much of the rest of this program um, is, is very much uh, about, about that. So I, I want to turn things over to Dr. Harrell, but thank all of you for for listening, learning, and, and all of you as well. To Dr. Gaddis, Dr. Gibson Young, Dr. Thomas, my I am a, a proud mother today of my students. Uh, we refer to to us as our girls, my lady. <laughs> And to my colleague in the School of Communication and Journalism, Dr. Sanchez Sanchez, thank you all very, very much. So just quickly, I'd like to acknowledge, if you don't mind, I actually invited Alexandria Smith to be with us today. Um, and if you don't mind, just stand, Alexandria, for a moment. <laughs> So Alexandria Smith is also a potential journalist. She has a life before her. And, and, and I'm saying all of this, thank you, uh, for recently, we intentionally, we, meaning the School of Communication and Journalism, intentionally developed a, an agreement with um, Tuskegee University with their English public relations multimedia students not knowing that this would happen. And we'd already planned uh, on May 1st, uh, when the Becoming the Beloved Community website will be launched, we'd already planned for Tuskegee students to have a space, yeah. for Governor State University students to have a space. Our goal is we've also invited Alabama State uh, University and our intentionality is throughout the state. Um, I just want to say very quickly that unfortunately, the disinvestment in Tuskegee is representative of what it means to not be a beloved community. And it's just, it's just a broader, broader, more heavy laden perspective than what we'd be. This is just the beginning, but you know, and, and I'm not demeaning, a child has been killed. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that child's death is wrapped up into negative stereotypes about African-American students, about historically black colleges, who's, and we know technically that, you know, 
months ago on the first day of Black History Month. Historically, black colleges were and universities were targeted by terrorists. So we had this opportunity to begin yeah. this conversation as well, to begin action, if you will, academically, practically. So if you would, please, when you see Alexandria, there are other Tuskegee students here, be intentional about beginning this process of beloved. Mm -hmm. And I thank you for your authenticity, for your vulnerability, and encouraging us to be truthful mm -hmm. about the spaces we lived in. So on a, on, and I, I look at this as a good note, it's an, a, an alert, but on another good note, whew, thank you for your prayers and well wishes. Robert P. Jones is here in Auburn. <laughs> <laughs> he arrived safely on the plane and uh, it's my understanding, according to our colleague Ty Cohen, they're in the car, they're driving from the hotel, he will be here <laughs> for lunch and for the rest of the time. Uh, but again, and I just wanna say, Again, very quickly, I tried. And I cannot uh, forget the people who are always supportive, and thank you to the board members for from the Montgomery Museum of Fine uh -huh. Arts uh -huh. in Montgomery. They're here with us. If you would just stand quickly, front end, and more on the way. And of course, we, we have to acknowledge them. Uh, um, Cindy, because their quilt is here <laughs> in the Jules College Smith Museum of Fine Arts at, at um, uh, Auburn University and which um, Dr. Gaddis displayed. So thank you all for the beginning of this process. Please stay with us if you can all day. Should I turn it back over to Cindy or Chris? How do you want? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so Hannah, and I forgot to say Hannah so much, your last name? Hannah Tuberwell. Okay, do you want to come up and read what you wrote, in the, and we will break for lunch after this. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Okay. So, walk around. Oh, you step. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, um, my name is Hannah Teberbaugh. I currently live in the south suburbs of Chicago, Illinois. And I was at UIC, which is on the west side of Chicago, for 90 credits of my college career. And then um, I came to Governor State at this semester. And this is actually one of the very first trips um, that I've been on with the school. It's been amazing. I've met so many amazing people, especially in this room, um, friends family is is what I feel like I'm surrounded by and it's been an honor. Um, I'd also like to say I'm an artist. So how I process trauma and pain is always through um, art and um, perspective. So I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing. I have a dream, a vision, and it starts at the crowds of thousands of white men who have ripped a man, a father, a son, a brother from his home, tortured him, his body, and hung him from a tree. I pause there. There's a silence, a healing silence, that gives breath and time to listen. There's a long, drawn-out exhale. The men in the crowd shake their heads as if waking up from a dream, and they tear down their brother. They pull him off the tree and they embrace him. The same white hands that broke skin heal the wounds. They remove him from the tree. They embrace him and they carry him home to his family. That is my dream. And you cannot change the past and you cannot rewind. But from the work that is being done in this very room, this very room, we can embody that truth for our ancestors. And if I place that truth of the scene on the stage and I look out, I see the ancestors of other people who have spoken on this panel today in the room, hugging, laughing. And to me, that is a beloved community. Thank you. 
Lunch begins now.